Hi, and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. So today I want to tackle something really lofty, and that is the question of why even bother practicing piano at all? So in the last couple of videos, we've been talking about goals and planning, and that is really important. You got to do that. Stay organized. That's good. But we also have to go a little deeper than that sometimes. What is your underlying drive to practice piano? What's what's getting you to the bench? Why even bother setting goals? Why is it important to practice piano? I mean, practicing piano doesn't solve world hunger or, you know, do any anything crazy like that. So why bother? So in today's video, I want to go on a little bit of a journey with you. And I'm going to share some aspects of my life story that I think are going to be relevant to this discussion. And I want to talk to you about the issue of motivation. And let's try to see if we can find what it is that is driving you to practice piano in the first place. I hope this will be helpful for those of you like myself, as you'll soon see, who have struggled with motivation over the years. There are probably those of you out there who have never had an issue with motivation when it comes to piano practice, who are just like always intrinsically inspired and motivated and you've never really needed to think about too much. And that is awesome for you. I'm kind of jealous, but that is amazing. Keep doing what you're doing. This probably isn't the video for you. But for the rest of us who maybe like stumbled and had issues with motivation in the past, that's why I want to talk about these things with you. So this is going to be a long video. I can already tell this is a long introduction. So what I want you to do is get comfortable. I don't know if you like drink coffee or tea, but let's let's like let's do this. I want to challenge you today and let's let's really think about the purpose and the meaning behind playing piano. And I just want to say this right from the beginning. I don't want this to be a one-sided conversation. I don't want it just being like me talking at you. And I know that I'm the one in front of the video here, but I really encourage you to leave a comment with your thoughts and maybe your own life experiences and your own ideas on motivation and stuff like that as we get into it. Because maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm like the only one who thinks this way and my ideas are crazy and like way off in left field. Tell me if you think that's true or if you agree or if you have like additional things to add. I think it helps all of us to leave a comment. So let's get really into it now. So speaking generally for a second, this isn't just piano practice, but just my life as a whole. Sometimes all I really need is a little bit of planning and I'm good to go. I've got like the enthusiasm and I'm passionate and I'm like, I'm eager to begin whatever task it is. I just need to like sharpen my focus a little bit and then I'm good. But sometimes I'm unmotivated. And then when I'm unmotivated, I'll think to myself, what better way to get motivated than to do some planning? So I try to motivate myself by planning and I set goals and that works for like two days. And then my goals end up in the garbage bin and I know better than when I'm when I started. And then I'm kind of stumped. Well, what's the problem? And here's what my brain does. My brain goes into like strict teacher mode, like, you know, that kind of like that gnarly teacher you had in your youth that you like shudder at the memory. Yeah, that's what my brain does to myself. And it says, you're not self-disciplined enough. I'm not working hard enough. I'm being too lazy. Or maybe I'll think the goal is too challenging. Or maybe I'll think the goal isn't challenging enough. Or, you know, the really common one, there's not enough time in the day to do all of this. And the list just goes on with all those negative questions. And obviously there's a big problem with all that like negative self dialogue that doesn't help anyone. But the bigger question that I really want to talk about with you is when you're pushing yourself, you're planning and you're trying to motivate yourself and all of this, but it's not working. What do you do? What do you do when piano practice is at like the very bottom of your priority list? Then what? So along that line of thinking, we encounter a couple questions. And these are questions that most of us have asked along the years at least once. And when I do this in the blog post, I'm going to like underline it and bold it because I, I think it's important. So the first question we sometimes ask ourselves is, should I just quit piano because it's such a struggle? And question number two we ask ourselves is, should I just grit my teeth and bear it and persevere because I said I was gonna? So to answer those questions, I want to talk about my life story a little bit because I've done both. I've quit piano for large periods of time, which is kind of a big deal if you're a musician and you teach piano. And I've also gone in the opposite direction where I've like struggled really hard through practicing, even though I wasn't like getting anything out of it. And it was just breaking my brain. And neither of those choices sound really good either, right? So there's got to be like a better way. So 
I'm going to get into the story a little bit. It might be a little bit sprawling, but I promise we'll circle back around to the main point of this video, which is what's the point of even practicing at all? I decided to take my grade nine and 10 Royal Conservatory exams in adulthood, which is what a lot of people do because they're higher levels and you don't always get to those as a kid. So I was living in Toronto when I was working towards my grade nine and that was cool. But what wasn't cool is that I was pretty broke um, I was living in a tiny apartment and I hated my job. Basically, like life was pretty grim and uninspiring and I didn't want to have any of that. So that's when I asked myself those two questions. Do I quit? Is it like worth it? Or do I, you know, grit my teeth and bear it? Most people would say that you should just like power through that unhappy job. But again, I wasn't having any of that either. So what I ended up doing was quitting, which created its own little trail of disaster. But it led to um, one of the best decisions I've ever made, which was starting to teach piano independently. Because I, there I was, I was broken jobless, just like, just like that. I just had it. So I was like freaking out a little bit, like what do I do to start making money right now? And luckily in the past, I had been an, an employee and I taught um, I taught piano lessons through an institution. So I had experience with being a piano teacher. I just never actually done it on my own. So I hustled hard. I put up posters in the neighborhood and I networked with other piano teachers and I like went crazy on Kijiji and Craigslist and basically did everything. And within six months, I had a full schedule. I basically went from feeling like I had absolutely no control over my life. My life was just like, drab, dismal thing to being like the captain of my own ship. It was amazing. And that all of that really rapid change happened because of being at this crisis point. Survival instincts can be one of the greatest motivators there are. So anyway, there I am teaching in Toronto. That's all well and good. But the thing about big cities, and if you live in a big city, you probably already know this, is that people are really good at like whatever they're doing. Like there is no room for mediocrity. So a piano teacher in Toronto doesn't just like have a university degree, like pff, peasants. They have like a master's degree and they have their ARCT and like performance and whatever. And they've like played as a backup musician to share. So basically here I am, this like random 20 something with zero degree. I never went to university and all I had was my grade eight RCM certificate. Literally the only thing I had going for me is that I had had piano teacher experience in the past. I'd, I'd done it for like five or six years prior. So that was my push to do my grade nine exam. And it was a really good motivator. I did my exam pretty quickly. It was pretty easy. I got good marks on all of my tests and I got like I did a pedagogy exam just to, you know, train myself in teaching and catch up to all these other, you know, super professional, high powered business teachers. So that was great. Then I got to grade 10. And that's where poop hit the fan and things started to become problematic. So at the point that I started working toward my grade 10, I already had a full piano teaching schedule. I mean, even though I wasn't performing with Cher or anything like that, people were still hiring me and they were like, you know, they wanted me to keep coming back week after week. So I figured like I had to be doing something right. Even though I didn't have like all these fancy credentials that all these other people have, I was feeling like even though I was a small fish in a giant pond, at least I was a successful small fish. And it was because of this feeling of success that I lost my motivation to do my grade 10 exam. So, I mean, think of it like this way. Say you are in college and you're halfway through your degree and someone comes up to you and says, I'm going to give you your dream job. You do not have to finish school. All you have to do is like, come start working now and you'll get paid exactly what you'll get paid otherwise. And you know, everything else will be the same, except instead of doing four years of schooling, you just have to do two. What do you say to that, right? I mean, you could keep finishing your degree and, you know, pushing through the last two years, but what's the point, right? Like you, you're already at where you would end up if you did that schooling. So that's where I was at. I kind of felt like even if I did all this extra schooling and I finished my grade 10 and whatever, I'd still be in the same place. I'd still be doing the same thing that I'm doing now, making the same thing I make now. Nothing would change, so why bother? But I continued plugging away at that grade 10 exam anyway, because I said I was gonna, 
So I'm going to do it, right? That, that was just my mentality at the time. So all while this is happening, life is changing. We move to a house on the little house on the prairies, basically. And I, you know, started my own piano studio and that's been going really well. Things in my life I started doing piano TV videos. All that's been great. And here I am plugging away at this grade 10 exam and it's going horrible. So I hauled myself to the piano bench every day and sometimes I would spend like upwards of three hours a day just working. And it wasn't that kind of work that you do but then afterwards you feel this like gritty sense of satisfaction like oh man I worked so hard that was awesome. It was just hard. It just it always felt like a struggle. I dreaded it. It was just something that I felt like I had to do. So my songs barely came together. I worked and worked and worked and worked just for my songs to sound like barely adequate. And then eventually I did my exam. I got a pretty bad mark. I actually did a whole video on why I got such a bad mark for my grade 10 exam, which I'll link to on the screen if you wanna go check that out. There are many reasons I got a bad mark on that exam. And my grade nine exam, by, by contrast, wasn't like that at all. Everything flowed, it felt seamless. It, it was still hard work, but it felt like rewarding hard work. It wasn't a struggle. It felt like a, a challenge that I was equipped to deal with. So after my exam, I quit. I was just, I was just done. I was, it was honestly like just such a relief to not be practicing piano anymore after all of that struggle. Now, since I'm a piano teacher, I obviously didn't like, I, I still played, right? I have to help my students, but for my own purposes, I had to stop. So let's circle back around to those, those yucky questions from earlier. Number one, should I quit because it's just an uphill battle and it's too hard? Or two, should I just struggle through it and persevere? Or is there maybe another way? But first, let's like look at those first two. As you have probably saw in like my story, I've, I've kind of experienced both ends of the spectrum. So for the grit your teeth and bear it approach, I think it's a terrible, terrible approach because all you end up doing is spinning your wheels and burning yourself out and there's no enjoyment in it at all. And what I find the really big problem with this approach is that a lot of people see, including myself at points, seem to think that it's the right approach. That if you work really, really, really hard and you just deal with the struggle, eventually you'll like break through to this magical achievement plateau where the birds are singing and the sun is shining and it's just like that goal that's just always slightly out of reach and meanwhile your day-to-day -day is just this like unbearable torture just hoping that you might eventually get to that point so that is problematic hard work is good but hard work that feels painful to do is not good and quitting isn't any better I mean if you if you hate music or whatever, then quit, obviously. I mean, your life will be better not doing things that you hate. But if you're watching this channel, you probably don't hate music, and neither did I. I had been playing piano since I was six. I'm a piano teacher, I've been in bands. Like, obviously the problem was not that I hated music. So quitting did not solve anything. All it did was create just a void in my heart. I felt like getting into a country song there. Little void in my heart. But I'm serious. It's like, it's like if you have a really bad fight with one of your friends and then you're not on talking terms anymore. There's just like a feeling of emptiness that it leaves behind. So those are both like quitting is bad and gritting your teeth is bad. Neither is a good solution. And that brings us right back around to the whole point of this video, which is why bother practicing piano? How do we, how do we take it from this struggle and how do we find that motivational fuel that makes it feel like seamless and inspiring work. You could have the most amazing practice plans on paper that objectively look great, but what is your deeper motivation to accomplish those goals? What is your push? Why bother going for those goals in the first place? That is the thing you need to find. So another way to look at that is, I don't know, say you have like an amazing car and it's like such a nice car, but if you don't have a fuel source for that car, it doesn't matter, it's not gonna run. So with practicing piano, what is your fuel source? So when I was doing my grade nine exam, my fuel source was the whole idea that I could be my own boss. And I also wanted to keep up with my colleagues and make sure I wasn't like too far down the totem pole. I needed to like earn respect. But when I was doing my grade 10 exam, the only motivator that I had was 
this vague sense that I should, even though I didn't need to. But I felt like I just have to finish what I started. And that was pretty bad fuel. Admittedly, most people who practice piano don't have extrinsic motivators the way I did with my grade nine. I mean, the, the motivator of being my own boss is extrin extrinsic, it's external. But most people who play piano do it for intrinsic reasons, like they enjoy it as a relaxing outlet, as a creative outlet, as a way to unwind, as a way to uh, keep their mind sharp or whatever. There are a lot of good reasons to do it. And I'm on board with all of them. And I practice for all of those reasons too. But despite all that, despite liking piano, despite knowing that it makes me feel good, I've still quit before. I've still set these awesome goals and left them in the dust. I wanna use exercising as an example because I think it's similar. Exercising is hard work, but ultimately rewarding hard work when you know you like, sometimes you have to feel like you force yourself to get there, but once you're done, you're like, yeah, you're like ready for the day. And objectively speaking, not even just on a feeling level, but like a science level, there are a lot of great reasons to exercise. Like it's good for your long-term health and all that. I don't need to tell you that, like you already know that. And the same is true with piano. There's a lot of like scientific objective reasons why practicing piano is good for you. But that is still not enough. If I am sitting on the couch and binge watching Netflix, I can think like, yeah, exercising, that'd be so good for me, but, or I could just, do something else that feels good, which is sitting on the couch and be lazy and not have to do all that hard work. So the thought of something being good for you, like exercise will make me healthy, is not enough of a motivator. Being healthy is awesome, but it's too ephemeral. There needs to be a purpose behind it, at least in my experience. So if I say, why bother exercising? To be healthy. Well, then I need to ask another question. Why do I want to be healthy? And then I might respond so that I can live a long and happy life. And then I'll ask the question again, why do I wanna live a long and happy life? So I can binge watch Netflix? Probably not. And then that gets me thinking that I'm off the couch. So this is the direction our thoughts need to go in. What is the purpose behind our goal? Is there even a purpose? So let's swing back around to piano and maybe we'll come to exercise later. Why are you practicing? What's the point? Okay, so let's let's do the same game again. I, I'm gonna ask a question, I'm gonna answer a question. We we'll keep doing that, all right? Why practice piano? Well, one reason to practice piano is to get better at piano. But why do I wanna get better at piano? Maybe I want to impress all of my friends with my mad skills. Or maybe there's this piece just over the horizon that I really want to master. And once I master that piece, then I know I've made it. I've like validated it to myself that I'm a real musician. So I think, I actually think that one's taken us down a dead end. Being better at, a, at the piano doesn't seem to be like a very inspiring goal. I think of it this way, like, you don't exercise just to get better at exercise, right? Probably not. Uh, let's put this another way. So say you're walking down the street and you run into Lord Voldemort. And lucky for you, Voldemort is not feeling super murdery, but he does still want to curse you because he's evil. So he gives you the curse that you never get better at piano ever, ever again. It's a really obscure curse. So there you are, and you know, you're, you'll know you never improve. Whatever level you're at, you're stuck there. Do you still practice piano? Is there still a point? I assume for most of us, the answer would be, yeah, I'd still play. I mean, getting good at tough pieces is fine and all, but that's not the real reason that we play piano, at least most of us. For most of us, there are reasons that go beyond that. So let me ask the question again. What is the point for me? for practicing piano. Well, it makes me feel good, it relaxes me, and it sharpens my mind. Why does practicing relax me, whatever else I said, and sharpen my mind? So I will answer this question. Your answer is different than mine. It just has to be, we're different people. But all I can do, I can't tell you what your answer is, but I can tell you what my answer is and how I came to that conclusion. Maybe that'll help you think through your own ideas. So this is what I've come up with. I practice piano because it is an act of service to my spirit. Or if you want like less woo-woo terminology, I practice piano because it's a service to my best self. This is the same idea behind meditation or if you're a religious person, prayer. Basically, it's the idea of creating a line of communication between you and whatever your belief system says is on the other side of you. And that might be God, the source, the 
eternal nothingness, the flying spaghetti monster, any of that. Now, just before you think I might've gone off the deep end here, give me a chance to explain myself. So when you're having a really good practice session, you can experience something called flow. And you've probably heard of this concept. Flow is a scientific concept that there's books on it and TED Talks, but the general idea behind flow is that you become singularly absorbed and focused on a task to the extent where you lose all sense of time and space and yourself. You just become the task. And it's a feeling that is simultaneously very calming, but you're also very alert as well. Another expression for flow that people use sometimes is when you say, I'm in the zone. That's what the zone is. Experiencing flow is basically the best thing. We've all experienced it too at some point. Just that feeling of losing yourself in a task, but like, you know, you're just like at your best and brightest while you're engaged in that task is an amazing feeling. And you don't have to be doing a creative task like art or playing piano or whatever to experience flow. You can experience this in any day-to-day task even. Like you could be experiencing flow when you're sweeping a floor. Or from a social perspective, you could experience flow when you're having a conversation with someone. There are a lot of different ways to access it. So from a rational point of view, you can get into flow with music because music and playing music accesses a whole bunch of different parts of your brain, and very scientific of me, I know, but lots of different parts of your brain get engaged and you have to put in some intense focused effort in order to learn new music. And that alone is an explanation of why music can transport you into flow. But that's not what flow is only about. There's like more of a magical element to it too. Getting into flow is like stepping through a door. And on one side of the door is ordinary life. And on the other side of it is something extraordinary. And we've all experienced this magic in music, this feeling of when we're playing to playing it or listening to it, we are transported out of our everyday lives into something more profound. That is why I practice piano. And I suspect that's why a lot of us practice piano. I feel like I'm a better human being than I would be if I didn't practice at all. It's a way for me to access the best parts of myself, the parts of me that are focused and alert and inspired, and it connects me to this deep and mysterious pool that lies beyond my everyday experience. And the feeling that it leaves me with is very special and it's very sacred, and it's something that I can carry with me in my daily life. It's something that elevates the rest of my day and gives it more meaning and purpose. (laughs) And that's not to say every practice session is going to feel like this, like, whoa, I'm so inspired and it's so magical because that's not the truth of it. Anyone who spent any time meditating knows that. I mean, sometimes you have breakthroughs when you meditate, but sometimes you just get frustrated or just spin your wheels. It's more about the applied effort than it is the day-to-day experiences. And it's the same, the same is true with exercise. I mean, you could be jogging around town and sometimes you're gonna feel great doing it. And sometimes you're just gonna be tired or grouchy. It's not always necessarily the individual experiences that change your life, although sometimes they do. Sometimes what it really is about is continued daily practice that slowly shifts your life into what you really want it to be, which I think for most of us is something meaningful. So that's why I practice piano. Why do you? (laughs) Oh my God, sorry. I'm breathing.